All right, hello. It's Tuesday, December 10th, 2019 at one o'clock Eastern time. And this is Higher Ed Live, Marketing Live. I'm your host, Andrew Castle. On today's live broadcast, we're talking about the latest thing in social media. Of course, it's not the latest thing because it's been around long enough for Higher Ed to start using it in their content strategies is TikTok, a video app that is a place for creative creators to share short videos. I cannot tell you how many institutions I've seen ask, should we be on TikTok today? We'll answer that question and give you some ideas about how you can make the most out of one of the most joyful platforms I've ever experienced. This broadcast is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Higher Ed Live is a unique platform. It offers viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education and allows viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the latest industry trends and developments. Higher Ed Live provides live broadcasts, podcasts, and blog posts featuring exclusive content and interviews with professionals from institutions, journalists, consultants, and other thought leaders for admissions, advancement, marketing, student affairs, and communications professionals. If you haven't seen it, check it out now, higheredlive.com, or take Higher Ed Live with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast. Be a part of our live broadcast by sharing your knowledge. Participate in today's discussion by tweeting us using hashtag Higher Ed Live. We'll be checking the hashtag after the broadcast and answering whatever questions and engaging there as necessary. Today's broadcast is sponsored by Campus Sonar, a social listening agency offering social media conversation research, audience analysis, and actionable insights for colleges and universities. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. I am so happy today to be joined by Liz Gross, the CEO of Campus Sonar, and Jess DeLulio, which I pronounced wrong, the senior it's social great. media at the Rochester Institute of Technology. All right, let's start by hitting the whoa. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so Liz, uh, let's start with you first. Um, tell us a little bit about you and uh, Campus Owner. Sure. Uh, my name is Liz Gross. As you said, I um, attempt to run the show at Campus Sonar, which is a higher education agency focused on online conversations. Um, one of those conversations that I'm very interested in right now is what is on TikTok. So I, uh, full disclosure, have only created one poorly produced TikTok in my entire life, but I am an avid um, tinkerer and watcher and ponderer and looking forward to chatting about all things TikTok today. Uh, yes, you work at the Rochester Institute of Technology, which might sound to people that it is antithetical for what TikTok is, but you found a great success on that platform. We have, yeah. We um, joined in June and we were just kind of messing around because we heard it was the next big upcoming thing and it kind of hits that um, Gen Z audience, which are prospective students. Um, so we were excited about that. And um, since then, we have had a video that is at 9, 000, 9 million views and rising. Um, Glass Rain, where it's kind of um, a college of art and design, they're pouring over um, glass and it's coming down. And um, we've really found some cool opportunities there in all aspects of each of our colleges. What would you say, the first question, I guess, is why would why did that video catch on, do you think? What about that is, is it the music choice? Because TikTok blends video and music. You get to choose the music that you want. You can do some video editing in there, or you can upload a video. What about that video have you, have you pieced apart the success, would you say, really worked? Well, that video is really interesting, actually. So it went kind of, I hate the word, but viral on Facebook last December when we got the footage. Um, and then when we got TikTok um, in June, we posted it, I want to say, in late July 1st, and it didn't do great. Um, so after we kind of have spent the past um, six months or so um, learning about TikTok, kind of learning what works for our audience, we actually have reposted it. We had um, one of our student workers, her name's Missy, shout out to Missy. Um, she kind of slowed it down in some spots, um, made it kind of tiktok -y with the edits. We changed up the music to make it um, flow a little bit better. We reposted it and it just took off. Um, we updated a few of the hashtags we used. Um, popular hashtags that we saw were um, getting a lot of views. We changed up the music, changed up the editing, and it took off. So that was a really interesting um, 
situation that we at first did not perform well, reposted it, tweaked it, and there you go. So Liz, as a, an analyst, it's sort of how your mind works, if you don't mind me saying that. You look at something and sort of piece it apart and figure out what's good, what's bad, how is it connecting with audiences? What makes a good TikTok video? How does, how does the algorithm and the AI behind TikTok really connect with audiences that are engaging with it, with you who are such an avid uh, consumer? The algorithm is fascinating because nobody actually knows what it is and we're all pontificating of what we think it might be. It's like before anyone knew what Edrike was on Facebook, we're all figuring out how to beat the Facebook algorithm. Um, so TikTok is an attention platform, right? It is there to have your eyeballs and it is fairly addictive and the algorithm um, learns an individual's user's preferences I would venture to say within like five or six interactions on TikTok, and then just gets better and better and better. And people will think about like, okay, well, it's what, what content they follow, what hashtags are in it, is there a cat in it? Um, but I think it's also looking at like, if you're liking things that other sorts of people like, where you are in the country when you're looking at TikTok actually impacts your For You feed because you're gonna see some more geographically relevant uh, content and more than likely, and I'm not saying this because I have any special knowledge that anybody else knows. Uh, TikTok knows a lot more about you than what you're doing when you're in that app. <laughs> it knows yeah. probably knows who's in your contacts. It probably knows what AI has been used to recognize things that are in your photos on your camera roll. Like we can start getting creepy right away, <laughs> but um, TikTok knows a lot about you. And if people are inclined to like a lot of things about you as a human or as an institution. Um, you have a leg up on playing well in the algorithm already, let alone understanding trends and video editing styles and trending music and all of that. So it sounds like what Jess described was they tried the video before and then they TikTokified it. Yep. What I does like that. that mean? It was it's slowing it down. It's making it more engaging. It's what when you see a video, Liz. What is what's what's what is TikTok? Um, it is its own ecosystem and Is culture. it the music choice? Is it the, 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 the effects of the thing? Or is it, can you like really break it? Like, can you diagram the perfect TikTok? I don't know that I could diagram the perfect TikTok, but there's definitely categories. Um, and just jump in on this with me. But I think about some of the TikTok specific effects that um, in any other platform would frankly look stupid but make sense when paired with certain audio or certain memes on TikTok. TikTok. So the earthquake effect where your, where your um, video gets really shaky or the green screen effect, which is always very bad. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it works for a certain meme. Um, and that combined with the trending audio, like it, it's its own ecosystem. And I don't think anyone can produce content for TikTok without spending a significant amount of time there first. But Jess, you said like you sped up little pieces of it and slowed it down. Was that something that went through the, the normal video editing process? Was it like slow up this part and this is going to be the most meaningful part? Or was it just you felt when you watched the video? Was TikTok more about the emotional connection you have with the content? I think it was um, just kind of taking in all of the effects on TikTok, um, you know, it was really cool because the, the glass was being poured and, you know, kind of slowing that part down and then speeding it up in certain areas. It just made it more exciting as a whole instead of just having the whole clip there. Um, and it's interesting what Liz said that um, I agree that there's things that are just very niche and very TikTok-y. I'm going to use your phrase. There, There's just things that if you are a TikTok user that you come to recognize are trends or that just work there. Um, and I think just the minor tweaks that we made made all the difference just for that reason. Let's talk a little bit about trends because they are so important on TikTok. Um, what trends, uh, if you can describe them, like have you done the, um, the, which dancing trends have you done for Rochester, if anything, or do you just ignore those? So it depends. We have done a few of the trends. Um, we did the, I don't know if you have seen the um, choose your character. It's kind of like when yeah. you're on the video game and you're swiping through. We did um, a choose your residence hall and we had some of the residence halls, some Greek housing. Um, we did jump on that one. We also jumped on um, my personal favorite. It is the Adele song, Someone Like You. And it's where there's um, like one thing and then you pan out to the audience and they're singing and it's the live version we did that with. 
um, over 200 of our small Richie mascots, um, Richie the Tiger, for those that don't know. Um, RT. Um, so we have jumped on a few. Let me interrupt you right there, because that's an important thing I wanted to talk about, because that particular trend, the Adele one, um, yeah. to move the way that you did it took a lot of time, I'm assuming, to set up <laughs> all of uh, the tigers in a way. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, when you look at TikTok, it may be not so simple, but every TikTok video takes much more time to create than you think that it did. Just talk a little bit about what you have found about how long it takes to make something that looks that goes by so quickly. It, it really depends. Um, so for that one that we were talking about with the Richies, that was folding individual like cardboard behind the Richies, 200 of them, and then going and setting them up carefully. Um, that took a lot of prep. Um, the Choose Your Residence Hall one um, was actually, um, we had some student workers in our production department that filmed it and kind of spliced it together, both inside and outside of the app, so that took a little more effort. But then there's ones like um, we had one that performed really, really well. I think it's our second best um, talk right now. Um, it is our diving coach at RIT. He's paralyzed on one side of his body. And every year on his birthday, he does a yearly dive. Um, so for that one, we had our athletics department over there, and they just had taken the footage on their phone already, sent it to us. Um, we put some text for it telling the story, and we posted it. So for that, um, it wasn't as involved, but it performed really well, I think, because that was meaningful content and inspirational and um, really told a story. So I think there's, it's just going to depend on, on what you're doing, I think. Um, I think it can be a good mix of both. Liz, as a consumer, you've seen things that are funny, that are the fun little short movies, that are inspirational, that are heartbreaking. Um, talk a little bit about the possibilities and the spectrum of content that you've encountered on TikTok as an avid consumer. Oh my gosh, I prepared for this and made a list so I didn't forget some of the cool stuff that I watch. Um, so one of the things that I think is so exciting about TikTok for higher ed, if you choose to be a creator, is the ability to do education, not just marketing. Um, mm -hmm. So I personally, the, the feeds that I follow on TikTok are generally either educators or people who have just a really interesting personal identity experience that I want to better understand. So some of the really cool stuff I see, I follow a, um, a bit of a niche um, American Sign Language community on TikTok. I don't know ASL other than like, thanks to RIT, I can now say pumpkin. Um, but <laughs> I... I've been learning a lot, both like some basic how to sign, but mm -hmm. also what it is like to be a member of the deaf community and function in a largely hearing society. And um, almost all of my exposure to that has been on TikTok. I follow mental health therapists on TikTok who are giving like anxiety and stress relief advice in 15 to 30 second snippets that are fascinating. Um, I follow a university based professor who does a bunch of racial justice and equality education and he'll like do um, duets, which is the feature on TikTok where mm -hmm. you record a video alongside another video that someone else has recorded um, using exactly the same audio and they'll kind of have nonverbal debates or discussions with people through that. I follow doctors and nurses. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a med student um, in Minnesota. She's Dr. Leslie with an IE on TikTok. And she's a, a family medicine resident. And she's doing like educational videos about vaping induced diseases, what to do about getting a flu shot, be, combined with behind the scenes of what it's like to be a resident. Um, there's artists, there's, uh, there, there's students sharing their student experience. There are so many different things you can do on TikTok. It doesn't just have to be memes, uh, yeah. but the memes are kind of what makes it a culture that puts all of that stuff together. So all the things that you described, uh, the medical professionals, the people who are dealing with different languages, all of that sort of stuff. That's all stuff that schools teach. It really is, should I, because I am a social media strategist for a higher education institution, should I turn around right now after I've been listening to you talk and tell the people that I work with, we need a TikTok here at my school? You're watching my face just went scary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, here you go. <laughs> um, I I think 
No, uh, I think you should be paying attention to TikTok. You should be um, getting used to the ecosystem of TikTok. You should certainly be understanding what um, people are saying about your institution on TikTok using your standard like platform agnostic hashtags, um, or if there are folks who are famous that are always wearing your campus gear, like that's important. Um, but getting into TikTok is part of a well thought out content and social strategy where you know your point of view, you know what you're gonna focus on, you know what sort of community you want, and you know you have resources to be there. Um, I mean, that, that conversation about what it takes to make one video on TikTok, you might, you might have success with something that literally took two minutes to post. Some of the creators I follow also share how long it took them to make their TikToks, and they're spending 10, 12, 14 hours and 45 seconds of really great video. And the eyeballs you get for that could be well worth it, but mm -hmm. thinking you're gonna jump on TikTok and like start recording your day and posting stuff there is probably a little bit uh, naive. Jess, that sounds like what, how Rochester started, like, hey, let's take a picture of the statue and zoom in on the eye, and that, that's gonna be like a fun TikTok. Um, so yeah. I, and you did say about how you needed to learn about it. So my question for you, Jess, is a couple years ago, people like the conversation we're having now, people are saying Snapchat's the thing you gotta do, but Snapchat has sort of become a thing that you don't need to do anymore. Right. So my question for you is, is TikTok a fad or is it here to stay? I think with social media, you can never really tell for sure. But I think right now, TikTok is here to stay. I mean, with over a billion monthly users, um, and especially with higher education. So for us, it's kind of a big aspect of it is the long game of students that may be applying to college in one, two, three years. Um, we're hoping that they see our content in their feeds and they're like, wow, that's a really cool place. And then when it comes time to apply to college, um, they think of RIT. So, um, I mean, that's where the audience is right now. So I think that if you do have the resources and you do have, um, can come up with an effective strategy that it is worth it, um, especially for us right now, we've kind of, um, we've seen great results with it. Um, and kind of circling back to your question on the trend part of it. Yeah. Um, so, um, you asked if we had done a dance talk, and the answer is no. Um, we have done a few of the trends, like I mentioned, but I think the biggest thing is that we want our content to stay authentic to RIT. Um, so our Glass Rain video, um, which I think I might be wrong, so if I am wrong, please someone let me know. Um, but as of right now, I think we are. Um, that Glass Rain video is the highest viewed video um, in higher ed TikTok right now. Um, but I think that's also because we have this great glass program and it's very authentic to who we are and everything that we post, we want to tie back to the college and the experience and not do something just because it's trending or do something just because it's, it's popular. We want it to mean something. I want to ask you a little bit more about the authenticity because that's a word I hear so often when people talk about the content for their institution. How can anything be authentic when it's coming from a place of such planning and strategy? It's a good question. I think that it's authenticity can mean a lot of different things, but I think especially with us, we want to showcase what is happening at RIT. And I think that regardless if it is something that we plan out um, or if it's something that we're catching on the fly, I think if it is um, something that is really showcasing what life is like here, real things that are happening here, then it's authentic, whether we plan for it or not. That's authentic the... doesn't mean spontaneous or right. off the cuff. It means true to your values and mm -hmm. your point of view. So, and does that naturally come across in any content that you share in authenticity just because you're putting it out there? Doesn't that make it uh, authentic? Or do you have to really think like this is like, here's what we believe in, here's the, the pillars of what our school is all about. Does this TikTok video tick one of these boxes and then that makes it authentic? Yeah, so I think we've put a lot of thought um, since we kind of found our, um, found our, um, that's the word I'm looking for, hit our stride in TikTok. Um, we've really been putting a lot of thought into everything that we put up. Um, I know Liz had mentioned the ASL community on TikTok. Um, we have the National Technical Institute for the Deaf on our campus. And we've done, um, I think three so far with um, Blake Nitko. He um, works in social media over at NTID and it's um, TikToks that are um, 
sharing three to four words, um, seasonal words, um, teaching kind of those signs, and those have performed really, really well um, as well. So I think it's it just kind of ties back to this is what's happening here and, and everything that I feel like we're trying to really just capture the RIT experience and and trying to get every aspect of that. Liz, for the students that you follow on Hired, and I know that you watch a lot of them, um, what they're sharing their authentic experience because it's just coming from a place that they are creating their day-to-day -day life. Is there stuff that's happening in there that uh, a communications and marketing department could learn from, could use, could inform their strategy? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, informing communication and marketing strategy comes down to understanding your audience. So the more you can understand your audience, the more informed you're going to be with how to connect with them. And I, I think that by watching college student videos on TikTok and prospective students, you're seeing what their struggles are, you're seeing what gets them excited, you're seeing what questions that they have um, that they're just ranting to the internet about because they don't have the answers. You're getting to better understand their experience. And also to take like a more marketing angle on it, um, you're starting to see how they engage with other organizations and brands on this platform if they do at all. So you can learn from what is coming to them naturally versus what you might be trying to force them to do when they get an acceptance letter uh, or when you see them at a prospective student day. There are some, um, I made some lists of students that I follow on TikTok that I like. They likely have no idea who I am that I follow them or that we're on this like niche higher ed broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's important, like there are student experiences being shared, I would venture at almost every single campus around the country. And it's not just the big name campuses. So yes, I have seen a couple of RIT students uh, on TikTok, but mm -hmm. I've also seen the student who went to community college and is now at a very um, regional public institution, institution in New Jersey where she's doing audio engineering. She's a DJ, so like it's perfect. And her TikToks are all about DJing. And she's over 800,000 followers on the platform right now. Um, there is, again, in the ASL community, there's a new film major at USC who, over, who has over 600,000 followers. There's a hearing student at Gallaudet that is studying interpretation who has over 100,000 followers. There's a hilarious resident assistant at the University of Delaware who is King Tart, like Pop-Tart. Um, who's got over 10,000 followers. And then there is this, this dude named Dan. Um, he's Dan H. Frost on, uh, on TikTok. He goes to Tennessee Tech. He has over 200,000 followers. He just makes one video a day of what it's like to be a college student. And his bio literally says, a day in the life of a college student. And that is where our prospects are getting their information. About. Could I share that on my institutional channels? If I've done the listening and I find them out there, could I just post their profile on my institutional Facebook page and say, here's great content being created here on this campus? Or should I contact that student and say, hey, I want to make you an influencer? Definitely contact them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and start with right like i saw your tiktoks i think they're super interesting mm -hmm. would love to talk to you more leading with i'd like to make you an influencer <laughs> might be an interesting conversation <laughs> jess have you done that we have not yet that is on our up and coming we've identified a few students um we have one student um that is actually an ntid he has um, I think close to a million followers. Don't quote me on that exact number, but he does um, like music videos um, with ASL and it's a very cool concept and he has a great community there. So he's someone that we may um, look to tap into and we're in the process of kind of looking and seeing um, who else is out there and if there's anyone that um, we may potentially um, find value in partnering with. If you're on TikTok uh, at home at night and you find a TikTok from your school, do you immediately text your coworkers or do you save it to the next day? Dave and I pretty much, we're, we use Slack, so we're pretty much like, wow, like, look at this. So when, um, I think it was Liz that found, um, there was someone wearing an RIT sweater and um, people were like, oh, do you go to RIT? Dave immediately sent it to me and was like, exclamation point. Like, it, it's exciting and it's cool to see, um, especially because for a while it was a lot of that, um, younger generation and um, like pre 
college. Um, but I think that, I don't know, I've seen actually a lot of, I've been getting a lot of ads on Twitter served um, by TikTok that are promoting like working moms on TikTok and they're really trying to grab that, um, like a larger audience base now. Um, and I think that it used to be something that was just cool younger, but I think we'll kind of start to maybe see a shift um, to that older audience, but it's always cool to see someone um, on campus that's using TikTok. We have a few alums that are really involved in TikTok. Um, so they're also potential partners for the future, so. Do you report TikTok metrics? What metrics do you choose to report for TikTok and how do you measure success? Yeah, so um, TikTok does not have right now um, great metrics that it gives you. We always wish that it gave us more and maybe in the future it will. Um, we definitely look at views. We look at how long, it'll tell you how long someone um, watched your video for, so completion rate. Um, so we pay attention to that. We also pay attention to where people are finding our videos. It'll tell you if they found it through um, another channel. So we usually cross post our talks to um, Twitter and Instagram. So it'll tell you if they came from um, just a link somewhere else like that, if they have seen it on the For You feed, um, kind of where they were coming from, or if there's someone that follows you and saw it that way. Um, so that's something we pay attention to. Um, we do look, look at likes. Right now, it's really just kind of analyzing the whole picture. Um, we get really excited about views and then kind of looking at views and how many followers we get um, kind of correlating to that. But right now, um, with the limited information that we get from TikTok, it's kind of looking at the whole picture um, and just kind of taking it that way. Do you set a goal before you post each talk or is it just, let's see what this one does? It really depends. We haven't set goals um, in terms of numbers of views that we want. Obviously, we want them to perform really well, um, but I think we definitely, um, while not numerical, we have goals um, in terms of like, well, not, I guess, goals, but we have a strategy behind why we're posting it, and we're hoping that we attract the right audience for it. We always love looking at the comments and um, actually, Liz had mentioned this earlier, kind of um, where you're located. We always, um, um, the Glass Rain and the ones that have the higher views, um, they have a lot of comments as well. And um, it's funny, we get we got a lot of comments that were like, I live across the street from RIT. Like, this is cool. It's showing up in my For You feed. So it's always interesting to see um, where people are coming from, kind of the conversations around your content. Um, so that's something we factor in as well. Liz, as a I have a magic question for Liz. Jess. Can yeah. I ask yeah. Jess a question? Of course. <laughs> Just have you tried to switch to a pro account on TikTok to see what data you get? We have not yet. That is something that we have um, kind of gone back and forth with, but we have not yet. I haven't mm. talked to anybody who has, so I was curious. Liz, what makes a TikTok a success for you? How do you measure a successful TikTok when you're looking at it? Do you, is it the number of uh, likes that it's gotten, the comments, the shares, or is it just uh, how it speaks to you as a, an audience member? Oh, I'm not really like judging people's success when I watch TikTok. No, but, uh, no, for you personally, like, <laughs> what makes the TikTok work for you? Um, for me, it makes me yeah. laugh, or it makes me um, mostly if it makes me laugh, makes me feel like I learned something, makes me want to leave a comment. I've probably left less than five comments on TikTok. This entire year, um, it's it's hard to get folks to want to interact. Uh, makes me want to know the creator more. Some of the creators that I follow go live occasionally, um, and then you can actually have some decent conversations with them sometimes. Um, so if I actually want to know them more, I think they're doing some successful TikToks. But if I were to just like glance at a feed and and try and gauge like was this was this particular. Apparently, I'm calling it, I should call it talk because Jess knows more about this than me. That's what, what I have been calling it, so we're going with it. Yeah. <laughs> what, makes thing, uh, what makes this talk successful? Um, usually, mm -hmm. you're looking for, like, the as a public user, you're just seeing the, the like numbers um, right away. So it's like, oh, are there more than, like, 10,000 hearts on this? And then if you jump through and they only have... Like it's, it's sort of like a like to, to follower ratio, right? Like these talks mm -hmm. that are doing really, really well have a bunch more views or a bunch more likes, like to a magnitude of 10 or 100 than, are, than they actually are followers to the account. Liz, um, I just want to stick with you with this other question I asked just before. Uh, do you think TikTok is here to stay? I don't know, and I don't care. Uh, <laughs> 
there there was actually a really good comment i was looking at the um the hashtag feed of like who cares if it's here forever if it's what your audience is using right now um mm -hmm. I don't care if it's here to stay or not. I mean, Facebook was here to stay, but Facebook today is nothing like it was 10 years ago. Um, so it is going to be here for a while. Um, and that's, I think it's worth paying attention to. I think there's also some really terrifying things about it that institutions should consider as well. Jess, what have you had to give up to focus time uh, to develop your TikTok skills and to spend some time uh, using TikTok for work? I think it's really just been a team effort. So we have a few student workers that help out. Um, Dave and I both tag team it. Um, we also communicate a lot with the different colleges around campus and ask them what's going on and kind of, um, I mean, for the glass rain video, we've had other footage. Um, I won't spoil what's coming up, but we have some other cool things wow. that colleges are doing um, <laughs> that um, we, we've learned from them. So we're kind of um, collaborating on how to get that content and the best way to showcase it because they're the experts um, for that kind of topics. So we want to make sure that we're accurately representing um, this project and that it's something that our users, our audience will find valuable. Um, so it's kind of, I know it's very cliche, but it's kind of a, a big team effort. Um, I think that it's something that we're definitely investing time in because right now we are finding it valuable, um, but we wouldn't be able to do it just as a two-person team. We're very thankful for everyone that's helped out on it. I want to hear a little bit more just about the authenticity that you worked so hard to achieve on your TikToks. And um, as you've gone and had more experience with it, does it take more work or less work, or does it depend? Like, it's. I, I, I just keep coming back to this in my mind because it is something I hear so much about. And I just really want to give you the chance to share where you're coming from, both as a consumer and a creator. Where Where is the line between cringy and engaging? I think we, I mean, like I said before, we definitely want to showcase um, what's happening at campus. We never want it to feel like it's something that's um, to set up or we never want to explicitly say um, for when we're trying to attract prospective students, we never want to say apply now to RIT. We want it to be cool things that are happening. We want it to um, showcase campus. For example, we have um, a lot of really cool students on our campus that um, one of them um, put like an electric skateboard on a um, a sofa chair and he like electrically rides it around campus. So we captured that and um, that was really cool. So it's just things that are happening around campus. And I think um, that's a really fun one. Um, How would you find that? How would you recommend someone who is watching or listening to this and like, well, that sounds good. I really want to highlight the real things that are happening around the little quirky things that students are doing. Um, but I can't get out of my office. I don't have a big team of people to work with. Yeah. Uh, just me. Well, how can you find those things? What would you say to that content creator and strategist? I would say continue listening to your audience. Um, so for us, we have a large amount of our RIT community that use Reddit. So we had seen on Reddit um, this kid being like, oh, I, I uh, have this chair that I created. And people were capturing um, videos of him riding it around. So we went out and, and found him and made it happen. And so I think listening to your audience, listening to students, um, wherever they are on social, um, word of mouth, definitely talking as much as you can with um, others in your college or university um, and just kind of depending on that to get the authentic feel. Liz, why have you made so few TikToks? Um, I do not yeah. have, I'm not, that was the beginning of a sentence, not yes. a sentence. <laughs> um, I do not have a lot of time for um, visual content creation. Like I'm big on, I use Twitter a lot because I can very quickly type my typo filled autocorrect thoughts to the world. Mm -hmm. I now find myself going about my day thinking like, oh, that would be a really good TikTok. I personally don't <laughs> know how to make a good TikTok. I don't know how to use the features. And based on watching it so much, I already have this, this big idea of where I want stuff to go. 
So like when all the brands were doing the stupid responses to Netflix today or this last week on Twitter, which I'm sorry if you don't know what that is, but I'm not going to do it on Higher Ed Live. I really just wanted to do screenshots of every brand response to that um, attention audio clip that goes, attention, attention, I want attention. And then some really quick about social media marketing. But to me, that's going to take like 25 minutes and I don't know how to do it. So personal skill lacking and time. But I think that the thing that that says to me is you don't have to create to enjoy. You don't have Sorry. to create uh, to listen. You don't have to be a creator out there to be able to use it to inform the rest of your strategy. To be able to go into a meeting and to say, this is what our staff, our faculty, our students are talking about and sharing about. Let's address this in the other things that we are doing. This is a thing that we can inform our content marketing because people really love this part of our school. They love the fact that our students are making these quirky inventions on our campus. Let's find other ways. Maybe that can be in the magazine. Maybe that can be, and we can take a picture of that to put on the front page of the, of the website. So using this tool to explore your school uh, is almost more important than using it to highlight your school, would you say? Or is there a balance, Jess? I would say there's a balance. Um, I mean, I think that it's really important to be listening wherever your students are or your prospective students are and seeing what their interests are, seeing um, kind of what's going on. And I think even if you don't personally as a university or a person have the um, resources to create your own TikTok account, I think that it's still valuable to have and download. Like we have our, um, we encourage our news team to download the platform and just kind of see what's out there, see what's going on. And even if it's not going to be a talk, it could be like you said, um, an article for the magazine. It could be a news story. It could be just elsewhere on social media. So I think it's important to use as a listening tool. And then even if you get that idea from TikTok, you can use it elsewhere. So it can inform all the rest of the stuff that you're doing. I, I, could, I love TikTok and I want to talk about this so much more, but uh, we all have jobs to do. So last thing, just I'll ask you to do is to uh, differentiate TikTok and Vine for me. I think Vine obviously was shorter clips. I think TikTok is more of, I know Vine, people loved Vine so much and it was a very also kind of niche community, but I think TikTok is so much more. I mean, I feel like you can find anything on TikTok. It's like a black hole if you explore enough. I think that there's so much going on. There's so many unique trends and I think it can also be used where Vine was mostly, there was a lot of comedy on it, which is great. And I think that you can find that on TikTok as well. But I think, or yeah, on TikTok as well. But I think on TikTok, you can also use it as an educational tool. You just have more time. There's more editing features. There's um, sounds and, and it's just, such a, it, it's a more inclusive platform, I think. And there's, there's more opportunity there. So it was my last question uh, for you is, because you have done, so much research and, and listen and pay attention to uh, the hearing impaired and deaf community. But TikTok is such an audio focused platform. Talk a little about accessibility in TikTok for a moment. Please. Yeah, TikTok is inherently inaccessible to the deaf community, which is why I follow them on TikTok because they talk about it. Um, so good practice in terms of accessibility on TikTok would be to add captions for anything that is just being said verbally, just like you would on YouTube or on any other video. Um, and that is, to my knowledge, nothing that is actually built into TikTok. Every creator I've seen who adds captions is, is adding them their own as a text box. Um, I think, I mean, honestly, podcasts are inherently inaccessible <laughs> to that community as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the captions in there are the biggest thing. And ideally, um, Think of creating your content in a way so that the visual form is just as expressive as the audio form. Um, a lot of these trends, uh, someone who is not hearing would be able to spot just by like the movement of the dances or um, certain like like the, the choose your character, right? They would they would know what's happening based on what is happening on the video. So think about those two interplaying. Um, and then if you do share a TikTok on other 
platforms, which it's pretty popular. You can download them and share them anywhere from any creator, which is a little terrifying. Um, but if you do that, make sure you're paying attention to the accessibility options you have in those other platforms where you're sharing them as well. Uh, I love TikTok. Liz, do you love TikTok? I love TikTok. Jess, do you love TikTok? All in on TikTok right now. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok is the only platform that I've experienced so far where I've seen families creating content together. Yeah. And that's one of the most joyful things about TikTok is seeing young creators with their parents and their grandparents sharing the experiences together and having so much great response um, to that. So I just love it as well. Thank you so much for taking some time uh, to talk about TikTok with me and the Higher Ed Live audience. I'll go through and check to see. Liz has obviously been engaging with some of the Twitter content, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of the stuff that is out there. Thanks, as always, to our program sponsor, Campus Sonar, as well as M. Stoner, Liz, and Jess. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, have a great break. Uh, I don't know if Campus Sonar takes a holiday break, but I know that all higher ed institutions do. It's probably a time when Liz really focuses down and see what's going on out there in this world. Um, have a great break. I'll talk to you guys online later. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.